All right. Welcome to another episode of Small Chops Podcast. We're going to try to break this up into a couple of different episodes in case this is a little too long for some people, but this is going to be a reaction to Sadia Khan on Soft White Underbelly. If you're not familiar with Soft White Underbelly, this is a very, very interesting YouTube channel and where he interviews most of the people off Death Row, Death Row in California, if I'm not mistaken. He interviews oof, um, all walks of life, seriously. Um, pimps, prostitutes, hitmen, uh, drug dealers, drug fiends, all kinds of people. I don't know if he's pivoting in this situation, but he has a couple of very interesting interviews, starting with, um, there was a divorce lawyer who made his presence known on there. So if you haven't gotten into it, I highly suggest it. It's a very, very interesting channel. Some of it you'll love. Some of it will make you cry. Some of it is very cringeworthy. Like the like the family that lives in like super rural U.S. I don't know where, but, you know, just abject poverty and just the sweetest ignorance in the world, I think. But other than that, I'm going to start with this Sadia Khan uh, interview, and we're going to just play it and stop where we, where I see, where I deem fit, and talk about a couple of the topics that she has to discuss. So... Bear with me. I'm going to turn one thing on and then we'll get it. Sadia Khan, soft light underbelly. Let's react. You, you are a psychologist. You specialize in what? Psychotherapy and re uh, therapy re for relationships. Trauma and relationships. Which we all... Yeah, which we all <laughs> can't escape, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, covers everyone's life. Mm. So I had this conversation recently with someone. It, se it seems promiscuity has, has advanced ever since the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. First there was sex before marriage, and then people were having sex purely for enjoyment, and then having... Um, one night stands and now only fans and you know the divorce rate is rising which probably reflects that you know, are we building a better society or are we just disintegrating i think if we ever are going to answer that question the proof is in the stats um, in cultures where promiscuity is at its highest, we can't hide the fact that divorce rates are then at their highest, uh, mental health concerns are there at their highest, STDs are at their highest, and the measure of any success of any kind of trend is the impact it has on children. Whatever trend a society is facing, whether it's um, you know promiscuity, whether it's cohabitation, whether it's sex work, if we just measure the impact it has on the most vulnerable people in that society, that will indicate whether it's good or bad for us. And if we look at the rise of promiscuity, the number one kind of sufferers of this are, tend to be the children of such. I can't disagree with that. I can't disagree. I couldn't agree with her more. And she forgot to add single parent households because I think that that was a trend in the, it still might be going on, but it definitely started. Um, well, well, let's not even say started, but it was a, it was very much underway in the early to late 90s, um, early to the early aughts as well. It was one of those trends that we're, we're still figuring out the impact on children till to, even today, right? So, you know, households where single mothers are acclaimed and households where single mothers are really like propped up and given all kinds of accolades and even a culture that really believes um, women or people can raise children on their own. And I would say even without uh, a person, uh, like a couple, but also without their family support, right? There are people who've had children and then moved across the country, moved to other countries uh, with their children in tow. And um, the most vulnerable party in that situation, hands down, were the children. And we're still kind of unpe or peeling back the layers of trauma and issues that those children are facing. So I definitely think that that is uh, a huge plus and I absolutely wanted to add 
um, that single parent pandemic that we suffered through and that we, for all intents and purposes, are still going through dealing with in the West. Such behaviors. And therefore, I, I would find it difficult to see how sexual freedom can really be healthy if the people suffering are children, because they are then left with broken homes, not knowing who their father is, who their mother is. They're left with a, a, a plethora of mental health concerns. So any, any kind of trend that has a negative impact on children cannot be a positive impact on society. Yeah, it seems to be. Yeah. Is it, is it worldwide, do you think, or is it just... It is worldwide, and I would blame a lot of that due to the globalization of social media. Yeah. I Where did I see some, some state in the U.S. is going, to, in 2025, they're going to ban social media usage for anyone under 25? Yeah, good luck actually getting, filtering those new accounts for people that are actually under a specific age. But we are going to look back and say children having social media is a huge mistake. We see the mental health issues, the impact social media has on young people when it comes to depression, when it comes to feeling ostracized, when it comes to unaliving themselves or, you know, committing seppuku. It is one of those uh, things that I, I really, really think that we're going to look back and say social media is going to kind of be like cigarettes and alcohol. You shouldn't have access to it. Uh, or you shouldn't have access to it if you're under a specific age. Partially because it, whatever it happens, it's going to be on there forever. Someone's always going to be able to dig it up, and there's going to be records of your misdeeds, of your immaturity forever. So that needs to absolutely be culled. But for now, we're just living through, you know, good luck uh, with children really dealing with social media. Let's go. It's a fire green, by the way. This is an amazing color. And... You hear a lot of rustling with her, more than I've heard with anybody else on this show. It's, it just seems like she did not care about the microphone, that the microphone was super poorly placed. But just know that that is coming from the video and not from me. I think that you can be in the middle of Afghanistan, in the middle of Ukraine, or in the middle of um, LA, but your children are what consuming the same content. And the sexualization of TV shows is really interesting. What I found really interesting is uh, over the years, and I can only qu account for my own kind of experiences, I would see people like Britney Spears or uh, Miley Cyrus, they come uh, very cookie cutter, very clean, so they appeal to a very young audience. And then overnight, they become hyper promiscuous and hyper sexualized. So the young audience is now kind of catapulted into the sexual revolution with the idols that they were admiring. They have no choice but to catch up to their sexuality. And as a result, it's like we're kind of propelling children into sexualization, which I just don't understand the benefits of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the tail, on the heels of. I'm quiet on the set, the Nickelodeon documentary talking about Dan Schneider and Brian Peck and uh, Drake Bell and so many victims in that situation. Uh, yeah, America and the West has a real fascination with promiscuous children. It's very strange. Uh, but I that Britney Spears and Miley Cyrus thing, I absolutely agree. I think Miley Cyrus chose more than Britney Spears. I could be totally wrong, but just how I remembered it, I kind of always thought Britney Spears was a little um, was a little s more sexual than she than like we she wasn't cookie cutter at all. You know what I mean? Like, oops, I did it again. Was a very sexualized video. The pigtails, like the short skirt, the Catholic school dress, and all that stuff. You know how that um, runs in America. But thought that was very strange. And then she kind of just went full throttle. Whereas Miley Cyrus didn't seem to be on that same trend. I just remember It's the Climb. The Climb is the only Miley Cyrus songs I know till today. But I also do know that she kind of flipped the switch and got real raunchy as well. But uh, I can't disagree. I just think that those two examples are a little different because it seems like Britney was just a little more like the innocent flirty girl. And then she became like more overt with her sexuality. But she was always, she always had a sexuality. But Miley Cyrus really didn't seem to. And then one day she just kind of flipped it. So. Oh, yeah. It's becoming cool to it's the kids. Cool. Yeah, it's hyper cool for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so technology, you know, it's made our lives easier in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but it seems romantic relationships have become much more difficult yeah. than ever before. You know, there's pornography for men, which 
eliminates the man's need to ever develop mm-hmm. courage, which mm-hmm. takes a lot of courage to approach a beautiful woman. Mm-hmm. Sex toys for women, you know, millions of possible partners on social media. Mm-hmm. Sex toys, yeah, but it feels like social media would be a more accurate comparison to pornography for men. I think pornography for men is social media to, for women, simply because it takes away what is the most difficult part about finding or entertaining a partner, which for a man is um, gaining and keeping the attention of a very attractive woman, um, being able to approach a very attractive woman and, you know, try to spit your game or whatever. And for a woman to earn the attention and maintain or keep the attention of somebody who she's, who she deems worthy. I think those, both of those parts are very difficult. And it's really, uh, I think that's the one-to-one comparison. The sex toys, I mean, we've all, we've all masturbated. We've all always been able to. The the rose was crazy. And I guess there are a couple of other toys. Toys for dudes are still trash. What's going on there? Anyway, no, no, let's not. Let's keep it on the relationship aspect of this interview. And then one day probably AI sex dolls yeah. for people. It seems like. All of these things are just destroying our, our happiness. Because mm-hmm. I don't think anyone's happy watching porn all yeah. the time. Mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know if these women that are entertaining hundreds and thousands of men on social media are really getting anything, maybe just money. Mm-hmm. But we're all, in, we're all lonely and, and frustrated. I think. Absolutely. Are men struggling more or are women struggling more? I would say men are struggling a lot more. And I'm... Um, The reason I say men are struggling more with the advent of technology is what pornography does and what social media has done is placed beauty on a pedestal. So what happens is men are now seeking the most attractive woman to be with. That becomes their number one criteria. But I always say the number one determinant of how healthy your relationship will be is how attracted a woman is to you. As a man, if you bypass this very fundamental component, you will suffer in the forms of very abusive relationships. When you are a man who is dating a woman who's super attracted to you, regardless of how you feel about her, she's attracted to you, she treats you with respect, she'll be available, she'll be accessible, she'll be very easy to kind of get her to comply, she'll be all of those things that men are looking for, she'll be more agreeable, all of those things. But what pornography does is allow men to be hyper attached and attracted, and social media does this as well, to women who have no idea who they even are and have zero attraction to them. So they go into the real world in the pursuit of women and they bypass whether she's attracted to them. They just want the most attractive woman in the world. And the treatment you get from women who are not attracted to you is completely different. Ooh. She spit that last, that last bar was, that last thing that she said was definitely a bar. But she makes it as, she, mm, I don't think she knows men very well. Because, yes, of course, men are absolutely going to be looking for the highest caliber, the most attractive woman that um, they can approach or things like that. But that's not the only one. You know, men cast wide nets. Men are putting flypaper everywhere. It's not that we're all just looking for that 1% of women that is ultra beautiful. They're also sliding to the DMs of the girl that isn't all that beautiful or the, that isn't as attractive or whatever. Just seeing what can, what you know what I mean, like seeing what options they have. So I think that that one part is a little inaccurate in her thinking that men are just solely focused on, you know, receiving the attention of the most attractive women. Now, men are definitely casting a wide net, especially men with uh, status, men with financial security and things like that. Like they're absolutely trying to get quantity over quality. And yeah, they're still going for the quality women, but I think quantity is definitely going to be in their wheelhouse. But yeah, the attention I'm going to be I'm very curious about what she's about to say about how women that aren't attracted to you uh, react or react to your vying for their attention. They treat you as if you are a nuisance. <laughs> they don't show you any desire. They don't mm. show you any submission. And mo- most of all, they don't show you any respect. Oof. Oh, I, I hear this all the time. If a if a non attract if a a woman that is attracted to a man approaches a man 
for his information and he isn't attracted to her, he's going to treat her exponentially more gentle than a woman would treat a man that approached her and she's not attracted to. That 100%, I've been to that boat for sure. She treats you like a nuisance. Like, why are you bothering me or taking up my time or trying to talk to me? What is this? And that is a very humbling situation to be in, right? Uh, yeah, it's, oof. Man, I, I remember a couple of those rejections where it's like, wow, you know? Uh, but again, you know, not understanding what the woman is going through, not understanding how many times she got, you know, approached that day or whatever. But it, there definitely is a, a callousness when it comes to how a woman treats you if she's not attracted to you. So what's happening now is that we're cultivating households and relationships where men are idolizing women who have no respect for them in return because they're placing attractiveness on a pedestal. And um, this can only lead to unhealthy outcomes because women are the ones that file for divorce. And if you are selecting women who are not deeply attracted to you and not deeply invested in you, you're just delaying the divorce going to happen but you're just delaying it and making sure and she's just making sure she can just you know take the most out of you as she leaves so i think the destruction of society is going to be always in the hands of men and i think they're suffering more from the advent of social media yeah it seems like pornography mm -hmm. has taken away the one thing that makes a man a man which is having courage yeah he never develops that never. the need for it because he can just access any woman he wants online and mm -hmm. that's and the courage never comes into the equation. And it's a... Uh, again, it sounds like he's kind of pandering to her. Um, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But yes, there are men that just sit in the house and refuse to approach women and just masturbate, use whatever toys they have available, and just get deeper and deeper into the deviance that is online pornography. But also there are men that exist that use that as a, I don't know, pressure relief valve, right? In relationships, outside of relationships. And also there are men that exist that want to get better options. Increase the attractiveness of the women they pursue. So saying that like pornography is taking a man's courage away and men don't need courage anymore because of this and the third. Sounds like he's a little pandering, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt too until let's see a little further on. We're only six minutes in. The recipe for rape. Um, one of the things that I think that is so Wait, bizarre. Wait, what? Into the equation. And it's a recipe for rape. Um, one of the things that I think that is so bizarre about pornography that nobody really kind of addresses is here's the thing. The mindset of a rapist is... I want to have sex with a woman who doesn't want to have sex with me. It's that simple. That's the mindset of a rapist. We have taught everybody that rape involves holding a woman down, punch, she's punching, crying, kicking, and only then is it rape. But the fundamental core ingredient is wanting to have a sex with a woman who doesn't want to have sex with you. What pornography does is allow you to find a loophole to that desire. Having sex essentially with women who don't want to have sex with you, who don't know you, don't see you, don't do anything, don't want you. So it gives you that loophole and you don't even look at whether mutual attraction or affection is there. Now that is the fundamental ingredient of rape and what... What? I understand what she's saying about uh, the mentality of somebody that wants to commit those kinds of heinous acts is basically someone who doesn't, who wants to take what you have, something that a woman doesn't, or a man, uh, wanting to have sex with somebody who doesn't want to have sex with them. I get that. But to liken that to pornography, where plenty of women, especially in this OnlyFans age, plenty of women are making themselves available to suitors who are willing to pay for that pleasure. And yes, the woman doesn't want to have sex with them, maybe. And that's why they have to pay. But for her to say that if a guy is using pornography and a woman, if a guy pays a woman to have sex with him and she doesn't want to have sex with him, but she does want the money, so she agrees to have sex with him, that's borderline 
great. Like that's that's okay. All right. Uh that that seems a little uh, that seems extreme. What pornography also does is exaggerate the uh, um, sexual violence. It uses sexual violence with a woman that doesn't even know you're there and you're watching it and witnessing it. There is no way that can't be a recipe for sexual abuse in the real world. So I just think it just devoids men of what their true instinct is, it, which is to find a woman who desires them is now replaced with just finding a woman who will let him masturbate over her. That is tough because there have been plenty of times where masturbating to pornography has prevented people <laughs> from soliciting the attention of people they aren't attracted to, right? For example, I have a friend and that friend could be going through a you know a dry spell or um, maybe the people that he's attracted to and wants to have sex with aren't available to him at the time or whatever, whatever. And he is tempted to reach out to the person that he isn't attracted to, but that is attracted to him simply for sexual favors. And I've seen that happen. And for one to say that that person is more of a deviant because they're using pornography is a stretch. I, I agree we should be vilifying pornography to a certain extent because it does, especially sexual violence, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I was a young man who thought that, you know, certain things are supposed to happen in sex and I was totally off. But this, again, seems like a stretch where she's trying to put the blame of whatever childhood traumas or whatever chemical makeup a person has and saying that, you know, uh, pornography is creating sexual deviance. Now, there is some pornography that gets extreme. There's some that is just way too crazy. But I think that that is a very specific part of pornography, I think. I don't know. I don't know. All right, well, let's keep going. We're going to skip the sponsor. Thank goodness he has this tag joke. God bless you, soft bite. Boom. Let's keep going. Yeah, it seems like we've all become very distorted. Yeah, and I find it so fascinating, particularly when I watch your channel, we can all see what trauma leads to prostitution or what trauma leads to sex work. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It's no one that sits there and just comes out. So when we can disassociate and we just watch somebody getting that kind of treatment online and not for a second think, I wonder why she chose that career. I wonder how she got here. It is creating a psychopathy in men where they're just not processing feelings or not having that empathy. Same in women that watch it. I, I find it super bizarre, women that can just sit and watch pornography without even once reflecting, I'm a woman, I know that I would feel quite violated if this was happening to me and it was being filmed. How did this woman get here? Even women can turn that off and just enjoy. And I just think, I don't know if that's a healthy world to create where we can turn off empathy and replace it with desire and pleasure. Well, I, I think... I agree with that for sure. There is a certain level of uh, non-connectedness that you need to be able to just see a person, whether they're faking it, whether they're going through it, whether they're suffering, you know, but pornography can be violent in that you kind of turn off that, I wonder, like, remembering that this is a person. So I, I, I agree with that. That is very dangerous. I think if the woman experienced sexual abuse as a child, then oh. maybe opens up her mind to that. Yes, I would hope so. But it, what also it can do is desensitize them. It can almost make it feel like this is what my experience is somewhat normal. If I become hypersexual and I see people being sexualized, there's almost comfort in the, in the community. So it can make them really triggered, but it also can make them very desensitized. Mm. Is, is female attractiveness and, and sexuality the ultimate commodity in our society? And sadly, and women have realized that very quickly. What's happened is that we, women are starting to realize that in order to get a man to invest in you, to marry you, to be, to have that kind of home, gone are the days where he's looking for somebody that will just treat you well and be loyal to you. They are willing to sacrifice that in order to be with a woman who looks great and knows how to perform sexually. 
So what's happened is the uh, measuring stick which men use to invest in a woman is how much she pleases him sexually. So the good women or the women that are not so sexually averse or not so, so attractive are just thinking, I don't stand a chance really because even unattractive men can replace women with um, pornography but unattractive women don't have a way of replacing men. Huh? I've always been a proponent of a woman can get laid. Now, she may not be able to uh, lock down or secure the person that she's attracted to, but she absolutely can get a partner. A woman can leave her house one day and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to have sex today. Actually, there was a story. I was traveling through Central America, and there was a set of twins that I ran into. And it was cool talking to them because I was able to see there were two really, really cute girls, half really cute girls. <laughs> I don't remember. It was like half Polish, half like Spain, Spanish or something like that. I don't remember. But they were both super attractive. And they always made packs. One of them were telling me they never had sex uh, unless both of them wanted to have sex. They wouldn't have sex with the same people. But on a day where they wanted to have sex, they would both find a person to have sex with. And I thought that that is the confirmation. You know what I mean? Like, if you really want to have sex. And, of course, yes, I'm talking about two really attractive women. But I don't have any specific examples of women that aren't attractive. But I definitely know. I can't say that I know definitively. But I know it's a lot harder for unattractive men to have sex. Because, again, not everybody just wants to live off pornography. Yeah, you can use that. You can beat off three times a day. But you still want to have one, you want to have the knowledge that a woman is letting you have sex with her, right? A woman is accepting you and letting you into her, literally. Um, and the other part of that is being liked. Like, everybody wants to be liked kind of thing. So I can't imagine guys just straight substitute um, that desire to have another person. Yes, it is a crutch, but I don't think it's a substitute. So they, they suffer and all they might turn to is surgeries and fillers and all that sort of stuff. So being an unattractive woman is a really difficult time to be alive for them. I think a lot of people talk about how hard it is for men that can't get women, but no one mentions how difficult it is for women who can't get men. They do exist. Who can't get the man they want. That is the only correction that I would make there because I do think that they can. There's a there's this kind of rumor online that every woman can have sex if she wants it. It's not that easy. If you're an unattractive woman, men would rather turn to porn than be with you. So she has it way harder than an unattractive man because if he really wants to pleasure himself he can do that himself. So, yeah. Yes, she doesn't know men. I don't know why because she's a couples therapist and this is very strange to hear. Uh, I don't know what her credentials are. But to say that a man can just turn to pornography and completely disregard her is absolutely false. Men can still turn to pornography and they still want a live person. We still want somebody that says yes to us, even if they're unattractive, even if they're not our first choice. They are still very capable of soliciting the attention and sex from a man. Might not be good sex, might not be the sex from a person they're attracted to, but they can absolutely still have sex. Yes. I've, heard, I've heard you say one of the most interesting things I've heard, mm -hmm. I think, ever on this topic is that uh, particularly attractive women mm -hmm. are almost a different species than yeah. your average woman. They, they go through life with a completely different experience. And it's not all negative. I'm not saying it in a negative way. A lot of it, there's a lot of perks to it. But the main kind of ramification of being beautiful is you are, you're a commodity or you're a threat. One or the other. You polarize people. You, the, people are never neutral to a beautiful woman. You can never just see a beautiful woman and she just walks past you and you're neutral. You can do that with <laughs> average women. New you can't, I mean, it's, uh it's not, it's beauty. It's hard to do that with beauty. Whether you see a beautiful painting, whether you see a beautiful car, whether you see a beautifully constructed building, whether you see beautiful artwork, graffiti, like it's hard to just see beauty 
and just pass it, pass it by. So I think a lot of beautiful women confuse the attention as if people are looking at them, but people are looking at their beauty. I don't know how to describe that. Neutral. And then she has to earn your either respect or disrespect. She has to do something to cause that reaction in you. As a beautiful woman, you can do absolutely nothing and you can incite intense hatred in either men and women, mainly women, but even men. They might see a really beautiful woman and intensely start to criticize her so that they almost kind of skip the rejection part. They, unconsciously, they're rejecting her before she can reject them. So they might say things like, oh, she wears so much makeup. This is a, or, oh, I bet that she's had so much. It's their way of unconsciously kind of diminishing her before she has the chance to do that to them or a, or they'll be hyper positive about her so there might be men who are really put her on a pedestal there might be women who want to be just like her and either or is just not a fair place to be in so the beautiful women either over identify with being beautiful make that their entire personality and go down that career or they get really if they're trying not to make that their career not make that identity they suffer in the form of vacuous relationships and a lot of negativity from uh, same sex. Yeah, that, that, that's what I see, yeah. particularly like in the comments on my channel. If I post a video of a particularly attractive female, yeah. or, or even a man who's attractive, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily physically, but maybe his, mm -hmm. his personality or his charisma, whatever, the comments will be crueler than anything you'll Isn't ever see. Isn't that crazy? Like, the more... Oh, you're, you're going to hit the wall and <laughs> see what she looks like in 10 years. Listen. You know it's going to suck for her. And, uh, you know, just all these terrible comments. Yeah, and you... Which, which, which happens to everybody. Yeah, but I would, I would imagine, uh, and I can only go by my own experience, but I would imagine if I was severely overweight or considerably older or whatever and saying the exact same thing, I might still attract hate because I know I, what I talk about is quite controversial, but I doubt the hate would be directed to my appearance. Whereas the way I stand at the moment on social media, I'm not trying to be negative. There's lots of beautiful comments and lots of very nice things that are said to me. But I went into social media with zero kind of expectation that any appearance talk would be it because that's not what I came here for. But it still becomes a focus. So um, I kind of just, I'm very numb to it. It's something I've experienced my whole life. And I think I experienced so much negativity with appearance only because I never pursued a career that monetizes appearance. I was always a teacher. I was always something academic I was always in that realm and in that realm um, people can't accept the two worlds colliding so I always got a lot of negativity from it which is fine it's okay and, and they're right one day you do hit the wall and it will go and then you won't have to worry about it so much <laughs> I, I want to clown her and be like yeah that's why you got the takes that you have because you're beautiful she's beautiful like there's no there's no two ways about that but I also think that that maybe is the reason she has some of these really wild takes that I don't agree with. Um, there could be a lot of people that are just like confirming what she knows to be wrong, what she thinks is right, but it's actually wrong. And because, you know, she got a couple of yes men in her, in her side or something like that, it's very strange to hear that. But uh, yeah, I absolutely think that it is commendable, somebody that doesn't use their looks, especially somebody that's been beautiful their whole lives, right? Many of us have gotten our beautiful people's card way later in life. And there are people who've grown up with this privilege. So it's really interesting to see. But I do commend people that want to be more than their looks, especially after a certain age. Um, now, nah, if you're young and bad, like be young and bad and do all the raunchy things that you're going to do. Make the money, take the trips, do all the crazy things because that's not going to last. Um, but those that choose to like forego that and you know, pursue academics or pursue, like she said, she was an educator. Um, commendable, for sure. But it also has to do with her culture, I'm sure, because this doesn't seem to be somebody who grew up in the States. It's, it's oh, no, and it said that she grew up in, it said she grew up in London and she lives in, du or she lives in London and in Dubai, but I, I don't know if they say where she grew up. Um, attracted women also to, to make friends. Yes, very much so. There's so you many of them that I've, that I've met don't, if they do have friends, they're very... They're not competitive. Yes. 
That's the key. A very unattractive female would be friends with a particularly attractive one. Yeah, it has to be um, a woman that genuinely is happy in her own circumstance. And there is zero competitiveness. But if there's even one thing that she sees in your life that she wants, and that could just be male attention, it could be the uh, appreciation you get from other people, it could be anything. Unfortunately, the relationship starts to deteriorate from the inside out. And it's very difficult because this is the thing where guys always say, oh, go, men and women can't be friends. But from my personal experience, if, if, we, if you're an attractive woman, if you don't have any male friends, you're going to suffer in the form of very competitive female friends. So you're going to be very lonely. You're going to have to find friends somewhere. Um, oh, I was that proponent as well. I said there's no... I said for a long time there's no value in having friends of the opposite sex. And I vehemently disagree with that now. Uh, I think it's very helpful for us to learn about the opposite sex through our friends, um, learn about how people operate, how people think, what people think, what people do in you know, dating situations and things, things like that, being able to see how your attractive female or, or opposite sex friend friends um, act in the dating scene is very, very important. But also, having attractive platonic relationships, I still, I'm still very wary of that. Do I have that in my life? Do I have that in my life right now? I don't think I have platonic relationships with anybody that I'm super attracted to. Nah. I don't know if that works for me. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, so it is very difficult. Have you noticed that with women as well, that they tend to be very competitive? But this is why I just, so I find the whole movement of being a feminist and whole like girl power and girl's girl and I'm a girl's girl, it's so fake. It's so, so fake. Like the reality is, it, it, you, why would I, why is there girl code, girl ghost, when you guys are the first to throw each other under the bus? Sheesh! That got, that got me thinking about the finale of Love is Blind. Yes, I watched Love is Blind. I can't help it. I'm very interested in relationships. And I'm very interested in seeing interpersonal dynamics. Uh, and how Sue Ann pursued the dude that she was attracted to. And how Laura threw that dude under the bus even before all of the debacle of him um, talking to her came to light. Like she treated homeboy like he was a loser. She was not attracted to him at all. And I wouldn't say that she threw a girl under the bus, but she definitely threw him under the bus and then was clowning Sue Ann for trying to pursue him, even though she didn't like him. I don't like that, especially in the pursuit of love in the pursuit of like a real genuine relationship. I think that she I think that she really messed up there. But uh, what she was talking about, what Sadia was talking about right now, um, women throwing other women under the bus. I can't see that as being not true. Uh, I do understand that there are a lot of women who prefer uh, friendships with guys because women can be catty, women can be competitive and things like that. Um, but I think some of those relationships aren't genuine. You know, there's so many guys that are just waiting in the wings to, uh, or to, for her to entertain their uh, sexual attention or their intimate, erotic, whatever you want to call it, their attention more so than just a purely platonic relationship. So, I don't know. It's hard being friends with people who want to have sex with you. And I guess for women, it's really hard being friends with people who feel like you are competition. So, oof. If you're both after the same guy or if you see someone who's more attractive, it's, it's fake. Girls only show girl code when, or are only like supporting other girls if they don't see them as a threat. The moment that girl is a threat in any way, shape or form, then girl code goes out the window. There's never girls supporting girls. It goes, the gloves are off. So that's why I've never bought into this whole like feminism nonsense. Yeah, m men don't really do that. No, they don't do this. No, you see a guy at the gym who's who's really changed his body, looks really great. You'll you'll be like, dude, you look fucking awesome. Yeah. And you I, just congratulate him on, on what he's accomplished. And if the I am definitely a proponent of men complimenting men more. Uh, I really don't think that we have to compete. There's so many areas that we should we are already competing in, right? When it comes to the, the attention of attractive women when it comes to financial success. Um, just so, yeah, all these, those are the two big ones. But even in the gym, you know what I mean? I make it a point to compliment guys that are either 
um, transitioning, like really making uh, an effort to change their bodies. But also, you know, if you just smell good in the gym, I've been in the, I've been getting into fragrances a lot lately. And so I pay attention to how people smell, women and men. And if a guy smells good, if a woman smells good, hey, man, that's a really nice cologne. Hey, miss, that's a really nice perfume. And just go about my business. But Or, yo, those are some really cool shoes or whatever. I think men should definitely uh, engage in complimenting other men more. And not to try to hit on anybody, not to try to make any conversation. Because I'll literally say, hey, man, that's a really good fragrance you got on. What is that? And if they don't know, if they don't tell me, cool, I'm going right back to my to my sets. Because, uh, one, I'm genuinely curious if I like the scent. But two, I think uh, normalizing uh, men just complimenting each other is super important. And I have never had anybody react to me negatively. I've never had anybody look at me like, yo, man, what are you talking about? I smell good. But I'm like, nah. I've always had just positive M um, responses to that. Maybe it's in the way that I deliver it. Um, but I haven't, I've never, and I've complimented all kinds of people. So, Yeah really really important for us to um, talk to each other and lift each other up I'm going to rewind this a little bit so oh no so you'll be like dude you look fucking awesome yeah and you uh, just congratulate him on, on what he's accomplished and if there is a jealousy it turns into a healthy competition or it, it the yeah. jealousy is more competitive it's like you, if they're playing hard. basketball it's like a form of motivation yeah it's, it's inspiration yeah and, but it's an evolved trait it's definitely an evolved trait because essentially we have to rely on men for survival Back in, we couldn't hunt and gather ourselves and the more women there would be in his world the more unlikely we are to survive and get food and resources for our children so we'd now actually see other women as threats and the quickest way to kind of reduce that threat is to either undermine her beauty or undermine her chastity and suggest she's highly promiscuous so those are usually the two routes women go for when they're trying to attack a woman a lot of envy out there yeah there's a lot unfortunately mm -hmm. are all romantic relationships transactional I think, here's the thing, Even I think marriage. unconsciously they have, I wouldn't say they're transactional, but I don't believe in unconditional love. I don't think love should Ooh, be unconditional. Outside thank you. Huh. <coughs> I finished reading uh, The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm, and then uh, in Intimate Communion. Intimate Communion? Yes. By David Data. And they both confirmed to me that... There is no such thing as unconditional love in, re in romantic relationships. I think unconditional love is had by a parent to a very young child and then to, from an animal, from a pet, specifically a dog. I don't think cats can have unconditional love. I don't think birds love you unconditionally. Dogs love you unconditionally. No matter who you are in that moment, no matter what you've done, they give you that same 100% dedication and love for sure. So it's really good to hear her say that. She's definitely getting some more points. I want to hear her explain it, but nah, unconditional love does not exist, in my opinion. Uh, definitely comment if you have had an experience with, un with unconditional love, and I would love to hear more because I really do want to hear um, people's versions of unconditional love. Your children and your parents is not going to conditional love. I don't think love should be unconditional. Outside of your children and your parents is not going to be unconditional. I think it, if somebody treats you badly, you're no longer attracted to each other. Somebody provides no benefit to you and you provide no, you've got no connection. You're not going to be unconditionally in love with them. So I think there are always conditions, but some people's conditions are far more transactional than others. Yeah, that's a good so, way of saying it. Yeah, so I would say, like, for example, I might, my conditions might be that you have to be loyal to me, you have to be faithful, and, you know, we have to trust each other, etc. But another person's um, condition might be that you have to provide for me, you have to provide for my parents, and you have to do this, and you have to do it. So just to put, everybody has conditions. Some of those conditions are far more transactional than others. And how you know how transactional it is, is how attracted the person is. If they are genuinely attracted to you, it gets less and less transactional. As the attraction decreases, the transaction increases. Mm. Mm. Who benefits more in marriage, man or woman? 
I think there's no benefit for a man, unfortunately, in the Western way of marriage. I think it's so sickening that, you know, we have this agreement that women, when they divorce a man, they can just leave with a lot of his money or expect alimony for the rest of their life. And one of the things I always ask women is, are you going to have sex with him after you divorce for the rest of your life? And she's like, why would mm. I do that? I was like, then why do you expect payment for the rest of your life? That it's so strange that they want the perks and the lifestyle, the one that they attained from jumping on the back of their husband after the divorce, yet they wouldn't give anything after the divorce. They didn't even give a lot of that during the marriage, let alone after. So I feel like it's a, a really, it's almost a culture of creating sadistic women by pushing that kind of you get half after the divorce and they seem to say well you know a, a lot of the excuses oh but I wasted like, so many years being dedicated to him I wasted but well, you both wasted it that's a that's a risk you take you he also wasted many years being de investing in you and he could have been investing in lots of other people so I just think that this uh, that's why I would be as a man living in the West unless it's for religious reasons I wouldn't recommend you getting married if you're religious absolutely but if you're non-religious and or your wife is put, or your girlfriend is putting pressure on you ask her why ask her why because a lot of them see it as a life insurance mm. for after they get divorced they still have a payment mm. plan mm. But this is the extremities, this is not the average woman. I would say this is more the extremities, but unfortunately that is becoming the culture. So I'm sure in your practice you see a lot of women that are, you know, getting into things that, are, that look like a sugar baby type yes, absolutely. relationship. Mm -hmm. um, are there women who marry men knowing full well that they're going to divorce them and take half their money? That's why they're marrying them. <laughs> yeah, that's, why, that's entirely why they're marrying them. And Whoa. <laughs> Part one, we're going to stop right there. 21 minutes in to the video, and I have 40 minutes of dialogue. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Chops Podcast. Uh, we're going to get into this more. We're definitely going to discuss further and finish the rest of this video. I'm curious to hear what else she has to say. Um, my favorite takeaways right now have been um, marriage, uh, marriage in the West, and then... Even though I disagree with some of it, I think her pornography take is really good. And then the beauty thing as well. Um, those are really, really poignant pieces, and I never thought about that in this particular way until I heard her speak on it. But for now, this is Small Chops Podcast. This will be out really soon, and then we'll continue with the rest of uh, A Psychologist's Thoughts on Love and Marriage by Sadia Khan. Soft White Underbelly. S Small Chops Podcast. See you real soon. And how you know.